Welcome back everyone to the special presentation of Cloud Native at Scale, the Cube and Platform 9 special presentation going in and digging into the next generation super cloud infrastructure as code and the future of application development. We're here with Bick Lee, who's the chief architect and co-founder of Platform 9. Bick, great to see you. Cube alumni, we, we met at an OpenStack event in about eight years ago or yeah. later, earlier, uh, when OpenStack was going. Great to see you and great congratulations see you. on the success of Platform 9. Thank you very much. Yeah, you guys have been at this for a while and this is really the, the, the year we're seeing the, the crossover mm -hmm. of Kubernetes because of what happens with containers. Everyone now has realized, and you've seen what Docker's doing with the new Docker, the open source Docker now, just a success exactly. of containerization. Right. And now the Kubernetes layer that we've been working on for years is coming bearing fruit. This is huge. Yeah, exactly. And so as infrastructure as code comes in, we talked to Baskar talking about super cloud, met her about you know, the new R-Lon, R -R um, you guys just launched. The infrastructure as code is going to another level. And it's always been DevOps, infrastructure as code. That's been the ethos, that's been like from day one. Developers, just code. Then you saw the rise of serverless, and you see now multi-cloud are on the horizon. Connect the dots for us. What is the state of infrastructure as code today? So I, th I think um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, everybody or most people know about infrastructure as code, but with Kubernetes, I think um, that project has uh, evolved the concept even further. And these days it's um, uh, infrastructure as configuration, right? So, uh, which is an evolution of infrastructure as code. So instead of telling the system, here's how I want my infrastructure by telling it, you know, do step A, B, C, and D. Uh, instead, with uh, Kubernetes, you can describe your desired state declaratively using things called manifest resources, and then the system kind of magically figures it out and tries to converge the state towards the one that you specify. So I think it's it's a even better version of infrastructure as code. Yeah, yeah. And, and that really means it's developer just accessing resources. Okay, not declaring, okay, give me some compute, stand me up some, turn exactly. the lights on, turn them off, turn them on. That's kind of where we see this going. And I like the configuration piece. Some people say composability. I mean, now with open source so popular, mm -hmm. you don't have to, have to write a lot of code. It's code being developed. Um, and so it's integration, it's configuration. These are areas that we're starting to see computer science principles around automation and machine learning assisting open source because you've got a lot of code. That's right. You're hearing uh, software supply chain issues. So infrastructure as code has to factor in these new dynamics. Can you share your opinion on um, these new dynamics of as open source grows, the glue layers, the configurations, the integration, what are the core issues? I think uh, one of the uh, major core issues is um, with all that power comes uh, complexity, right? So, um, it, you know, despite its expressive power, uh, systems like Kubernetes and declarative APIs let you express a lot of complicated and complex um, stacks, right? But you're dealing with um, hundreds, if not thousands of these YAML files or resources. And so I think, uh, you know, the emergence of systems and layers to help you manage that complexity is becoming a key challenge and opportunity in, in this space. That, that's I wrote a LinkedIn yeah. post today, there was comments about, you know, hey, enterprise is the new breed. The trend of SaaS companies moving uh, our consumer comp consumer like thinking into the enterprise has been happening for a long time, but now more than ever, you're seeing it. The old way used to be solve complexity with more complexity <laughs> and then lock the customer in. Now with open source, it's speed, simplification, and integration, right? These are the new dynam power dynamics for developers. Yeah. So as companies are starting to now deploy and look at Kubernetes, what are the things that need to be in place? Because you have some, I won't say technical debt, but maybe some shortcuts, some scripts here that make it look like infrastructure as code. People yeah. have done some things to simulate or, or make infrastructure as code happen. Yes. But to do it at scale yes. is harder. What's your take on this? What's your view? It's hard because there's a pro proliferation of methods, tools, technologies. Um, so for example, today, um, it's very common for DevOps and platform engineering tools, I mean, sorry, teams, to have to deploy a large number of Kubernetes clusters, but then apply the applications and configurations on top of those clusters. 
And they're using a wide range of tools to do this, right? For example, maybe Ansible or Terraform or Bash scripts to bring up the infrastructure and then the clusters. And then they may use a different set of tools uh, such as um, uh, Argo CD or other tools to apply configurations and applications on top of the clusters. So you have this sprawl of tools. You also, you also have this sprawl of configurations and files because the more objects you're dealing with, uh, the more um, uh, resources you have to manage. And there's a risk of drift, that people call that, where you know, you think you have things under control, but some people from various teams will make changes here and there, and then before the end of the day, systems break and you have no idea of tracking them. So I think there's real need to kind of unify, simplify, and try to solve these problems using a smaller, more unified set of tools and methodologies. And that's something that we try to do with this new project, uh, Arlon. Yeah, so, so we're going to get to Arlon in a second. Yeah. I want to get to the why Arlon. You guys announced that at um, ArgoCon, um, which was put on here in Silicon Valley at the, at the Computer History by Intuit. They had their own little day over there at their headquarters. But before we get there, um, Baskar, your CEO, came on and he talked about SuperCloud at our inaugural event. What's your definition of SuperCloud? If you had to kind of explain that to someone at a cocktail party or someone in the industry, technical, how would you look at the SuperCloud trend that's emerging, it's become a thing? What's your, what would be your contribution uh, to that definition or um, the narrative? Well, it's, it's, it's uh, funny because I've actually heard of the term for the first time today, uh, speaking to you earlier today. But I think based on what you said, I, I already get kind of some of the, the gist and the, the main concepts. It seems like uh, super cloud, the way I interpret that is, you know, um, clouds and infrastructure, um, programmable infrastructure, all of those things are becoming commodity in a way, and everyone's got their own flavor, but there's a real opportunity for um, people to solve real business problems by perhaps trying to abstract away, uh, you know, all of those various implementations and then building uh, uh, better abstractions that are perhaps business or application specific to help companies and businesses solve real business problems. Yeah, I remember, that's a great, great definition. I remember, not to date myself, but back in the old days, you know, IBM had a proprietary network operating system, sort of DEC for the mini computer vendors, DECnet and SNA, respectively. Um, but TCP IP came out of the OSI, the Open Systems Interconnect, and remember, Ethernet beat Token Ring out. <laughs> so not to get all nerdy for all the young kids out there, look, just look up Token Ring, you'll see. You've probably never heard of it. It's IBM's you know, uh, uh, connection to the internet at the, the layer two. Is Amazon the Ethernet, right? So if TCP IP could be the Kubernetes and the containers abstraction, that made the industry completely change at that point in history. So at every major inflection point where there's been serious industry change and wealth creation and business value, there's been an abstraction yes. somewhere. Yes. What's your reaction to that? I think um, this is, um, uh, I think, a saying that's been heard many times in this industry, and, and I forgot who originated it, but um, I think the saying goes like, uh, there's no problem that can't be solved with another layer of indirection, right? And we've seen this over and over and over again, where Amazon and its peers have inserted this layer that has simplified you know, computing and, and uh, infrastructure management. And I believe this trend is going to continue, right? The next set of problems um, are going to be solved with these insertions of additional abstraction layers. I think that that's really, a, yeah, it's, it's, it's gonna continue. It's interesting, I just wrote another post today on LinkedIn called the Silicon Wars, AMD stock is down. ARM has been on a rise, we've been reporting for many years now that ARM is gonna be huge, it has become true. Um, if you look at the success of the infrastructure as a service layer uh, across the clouds, Azure, AWS, Amazon's clearly way ahead of everybody. The stuff that they're doing with the silicon and the physics and the, the atoms, the pro, you know, this is where the innovation, they're going so deep and so strong mm -hmm. at IaaS. The more that they get, that gets come on, they have more performance. So if you're an app developer, wouldn't you want the best performance? And you'd want to have the best abstraction layer that gives you the most ability to do infrastructure as code or infrastructure for configuration, for 
provisioning, for managing services. And you're seeing that today with service mesh. There's a lot of action going on in the service mesh area in, in this community of, of KubeCon, which we'll be covering. So that brings up the whole, what's next? You guys just announced Arlon at ArgoCon, which came out of Intuit. Mm -hmm. We've had Mariana Tessel at our SuperCloud event. She's a CTO. You know, they're all in the cloud. So they're contributed to that project. Where did Arlon come from? What was the origination? What's the purpose? Why Arlon? Why this announcement? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the inception of the project, uh, this was the result of um, us realizing that problem that we spoke about earlier, which is complexity, right? With all of this, uh, these clouds, these infrastructure, um, all the variations around uh, you know, compute storage uh, networks, and um, the proliferation of tools. We talked about the Ansibles and Terraforms and Kubernetes itself. You can think of that as another tool, right? Um, we saw uh, a need to solve that complexity problem, and especially for uh, people and users who use uh, Kubernetes at scale. So when you have you know, hundreds of clusters, thousands of applications, thousands of users spread out over many, many uh, locations, um, there, there needs to be um, a system that uh, helps simplify that management, right? So that means fewer tools, more expressive ways of describing the state that you want, and uh, more consistency, and, and that's why um, you know, uh, we built um, Arlon. And we built it um, recognizing that many of these problems or sub-problems have already been solved. So Arlon doesn't try to reinvent the wheel. It instead um, rests on the shoulders of several giants, right? So for example, uh, Kubernetes is one building block. Uh, GitOps and Argo CD is another one, which is, provides a very uh, structured way of applying configuration. And then we have projects like uh, Cluster API and um, uh, Crossplane, which provide APIs for describing infrastructure. So Arlon takes all of those building blocks and uh, builds a thin layer, which uh, gives users a very expressive way of uh, defining Configuration and desired state. Uh, so that's that's kind of the inception of. And what's the, the benefit of that? What does that give the What does that give the developer, the user, in this case? The developers, the the platform engineer uh, team members, the DevOps engineers, they uh, get a, a ways to provision uh, not just infrastructure and clusters, but also applications and configurations. They get a way uh, a system for provisioning configuring, deploying, and doing lifecycle management in a, in a much simpler way, okay? Especially, as I said, if you're dealing with a large number of uh, applications. So it's like an operating fabric, if you will, Yes. for them. Okay, so let's get into what that means for up above and below the, the, this abstraction or thin layer. Um, below is the infrastructure. We talked a lot about what's going on below that. Yeah. Above our workloads. At the end of the day, you know, I talked to CXOs and, um, IT folks that, have, that are now DevOps engineers, they care about the workloads. Mm -hmm. And they want the infrastructure's code to work. They don't want to spend their time getting in the weeds, figuring out what happened when, someone yes. made a push that, that happened or something happened. They need observability and they need to, to know that it's working. That's right. And is my workloads running effectively? So how do you guys look at the workload side of it? Because now you have multiple workloads on these fabric. Right. So workloads, um, so Kubernetes has defined kind of a standard way to describe workloads. And you can, uh, you know, uh, tell Kubernetes I want to run this container uh, this particular way. Or you can use other projects that are in the Kubernetes uh, uh, cloud native ecosystem, like Knative, where you can express your application in more, uh, at a higher level, right? But what's also happening is, in addition to the workloads, um, DevOps and platform engineering teams, they need to uh, very often deploy the applications with the clusters themselves. Clusters are becoming this commodity. It's, it's becoming this um, uh, host for the application, and it kind of comes bundled with it in many cases. It's like an appliance, right? So DevOps teams have to provision 
clusters at a really incredible rate and they need to tear them down. Clusters are becoming more uh, It's coming like an EC2 instance. Yeah. Spin up a cluster. We've heard people that, use words like that. That's right. And before Arlong, you kind of had to do all of that uh, using a different set of tools, as, as I explained. So um, with Arlong, you can kind of express everything together. You can say, I want a cluster with a health monitoring stack and a logging stack and this ingress controller, and I want these applications and these security policies. You can describe all of that using something we call a profile, and then you can stamp out your, app, your applications and your clusters and manage them in a very... So essentially uh, standard that creates a mechanism, exactly. a standardized declarative kind of configurations, and it's like a playbook. You exactly. just deploy it. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the difference between, say, a script? Like, I'm, I have scripts, I can just automate scripts. Or... Yes, this is where that um, declarative API uh, and um, uh, infrastructure as configuration comes in, right? Because uh, scripts, yes, you can automate scripts, but the order in which they run matters, right? Um, they can break, things can break in the middle, and um, and sometimes you need to debug them, whereas the declarative way is much more expressive and powerful. You just tell the system what you want, and then the system kind of uh, figures it out, and uh, there are these things called controllers, which will, in the background, reconcile all the state to converge towards your desired state. It's a much more powerful, expressive, and reliable way of getting things done. So infrastructure as configuration is built kind of on it's a superset of infrastructure as code. Because it's you have, an evolution. You I need edge reference as code, but then you can configure the code by just saying do it. You're That's basically right. declaring and saying go, go do that. That's right. Okay, so, all right, so cloud native at scale. Take me through your vision of what that means. Someone says, hey, what does cloud native at scale mean? What's success look like? Um, how does it roll out in the future as you, not future, next couple of years? I mean, people are now starting to figure out, okay, it's not as easy as it sounds. Kubernetes has value. We're going to hear this year at KubeCon a lot of this. What does cloud native at scale mean? Yeah, th there are different uh, interpretations, but uh, if you ask me, when people think of scale, they think of a large number of deployments, right? Um, uh, geographies, um, many, you know, supporting thousands or tens or millions of, of users, there, there's that aspect to scale. There's also um, an equally important a uh, aspect of scale, which is also something that uh, we, we try to address with Arlon, and that is just complexity for the people operating this or configuring this, right? So in order to describe that uh, desired state and in order to perform things like maybe upgrades or updates on a very large scale. You want the humans behind that to be able to express and direct the system to do that in, in relatively simple terms, right? And so um, we want um, uh, the tools and the abstractions uh, and the mechanisms available to the user to be as powerful but as simple as possible. So there's, I think there's going to be um, a, a number, uh, and there have been a number of uh, CNCF and cloud native projects that are trying to attack that uh, complexity problem as well. And Arlon kind of falls in, in that category. Okay, so I'll put you on the spot. We've got KubeCon coming up, and obviously yeah. this will be shipping this Seg the series out before. Mm -hmm. What do you expect to see at KubeCon this year? What's the big story this year? What's the what's the most important thing happening? Is it uh, in the open source community and also within a lot of the the people jockeying for leadership? And there's a lot of projects and still there's some white space in the overall systems map about the different areas get runtime and observability in all these different areas. Mm -hmm. What's the where's the action? Where the where's the smoke? Where's the fire? Where's the peace? Where's the tension? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, one thing that has been happening over the past couple of Kube cons, and I expect to continue, and, and that is uh, the, the word on the street is Kubernetes is getting boring, right? Which is good, right? <laughs> boring means simple. <laughs> well, um, well, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Invisible. Uh, no drama, right? So, so the, the rate of change uh, of the Kubernetes features and, and all that has slowed, but in, in, a, in a positive way. Um, but um, there's still a general sentiment and uh, feeling that there's just too much stuff. If you look at a stack necessary for uh, uh, hosting applications based on Kubernetes, 
there are just still too many moving parts, too many uh, components, right? Um, too much complexity. I go, I keep going back to the complexity problem. So I expect um, uh, KubeCon and all the vendors and the players and the startups and the people there to continue to focus on that uh, complexity problem and introduce uh, further simplifications uh, to, to the stack, yeah. Vic, you've had a storied career, VMware, uh, over decades with them, uh, obviously 12 years, 14 years, or something like that, big number. Um, Co-founder here at Platform, now you guys have been around for a while mm -hmm. at this game. Uh, we, man, we talked about OpenStack, that project, you, we interviewed at one of their events. So OpenStack was the beginning of that, this new revolution. I remember the early days, it, was, it wasn't supposed to be an alternative to Amazon, but it was a way to do more cloud, cloud native. And we had a Clouderati team at that time. We would joke, we, you know, about the, about the dream. It's happening now. Now at Platform Nine, you guys have been doing this for a while. What's the, what are you most excited about as the chief architect? What did you guys double down on? What did you guys tr pivot from or to? Did you do any pivots? Did you extend out certain areas? Because you guys are in a good position right now. A lot of DNA in cloud native. Mm -hmm. um, what are you most excited about, and what does Platform Nine bring to the table? Uh, for customers and for people in the industry uh, watching this? Yeah, so I think our mission really hasn't changed over the years, right? It's been always about taking complex open source software because open source software, it's powerful, it solves new problems you know, every year and you have new things coming out all the time, right? OpenStack was an example when the Kubernetes uh, took the world by storm. But uh, there's always that complexity of you know, just configuring it, deploying it, running it, um, operating it. And uh, our mission has always been that we will take all that complexity and just make it, you know, easy for users to consume, regardless of the technology, right? So the successor to Kubernetes, you know, I don't have a crystal ball, but, you know, you have some indications that people are... Um, coming up of new and simpler ways of running applications. Uh, there are many projects uh, around there. Who knows what's coming uh, next year or the <laughs> year after that. But Platform, will, uh, Platform 9 will be there yeah. and um, we will um, you know, take the innovations from the, the, the community. We will contribute our own innovations and make all of those uh, things uh, very consumable to uh, customers. Simpler, faster, cheaper, exactly. always a good business model technically to make that yes. happen. Yeah, I think the reigning in the chaos is key. You know, now we have now visibility into the scale. Final question before we depart yeah, this segment. Um, what is at scale? How many clusters do you see that would be a, a, high, a watermark for an at scale conversation around a, an enterprise? Um, is it workloads we're looking at or our clusters? How would you yeah. how would you describe that? And when people try to squint through and evaluate what's a scale, what's the at scale kind of threshold? Yeah, and the number of clusters doesn't tell the whole story because clusters can be small in terms of the number of nodes or they can be large. But uh, roughly speaking, when we say, you know, large scale uh, cluster deployments, we're talking about um, maybe uh, hundreds, uh, two thousands, yeah. And final, final question, what's the role of the hyperscalers? You got AWS continuing to do well, but they got their core, IaaS, they got a PaaS. They're not too, too much putting a SaaS out there, they have some SaaS apps, but mostly it's the ecosystem. They have marketplaces doing over $2 billion, billions of transactions a year. Um, and, and it's just like just sitting there. It hasn't really, they're now innovating on it, but that's going to change ecosystems. What's the role of the cloud play in the cloud native at scale? The, the hyperscale yeah, AWS, themselves? For instance. Yeah, AWS, Azure, Google. Uh, you mean from a business perspective? Yeah, well, because technical. They're, they're, they have their own interests that, you know, they're, they're, uh, they will keep catering to. They, they will continue to find ways to lock <laughs> uh, their users into their ecosystem of uh, services and, and APIs. Um, so I don't think that's going to change, right? Yeah. They're just going to keep... Well, they got great uh, performance, I mean, from a, from a hardware standpoint. Yes. Um, that's going to be key, right? Yes, I think the, uh, the move from x86 being the dominant way uh, and platform to run workloads uh, it's changing, right? That, 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 and, and I think the, the hyperscalers really want to be in the game in terms of, you know, the, the new risk and ARM yeah. um, 
ecosystems and yeah. the platforms. Yeah, not uh, joking aside, Paul Moritz, when he was the CEO of uh, VMware when he took over, once said, and I remember our first year doing theCUBE, oh, the cloud is one big distributed computer. It's, it's hardware, and you got software, and you got middleware. And uh, he kind of oversimplified, well, he's kind of tongue in cheek, but really you're talking about large compute and sets of services, that is essentially a distributed computer. Yes, exactly. It's, we're back in the same game. <laughs> Dick, thank you for coming on the segment. Appreciate your time. This is uh, a Cloud Native at Scale, special presentation with Platform 9, really unpacking super cloud, Arlon, open source, and how to run large scale applications uh, on the cloud, cloud native for developers. And John Furrier with theCUBE. Thanks for watching and we'll stay tuned for another great segment coming right up.